Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well this holiday season. We're here to talk about a newest D&D book that I have very mixed feelings about. So to help you get through it, I brought a nice cat. Look how sweet and wonderful she is. Just laying here, letting me rub her tummy, just relaxed. She's wonderful. She's one of my favorite kitties, even though she always smells a bit like poop. I hope you enjoy the review. What's got you down, Ogger? It's my dungeon, Gobbler. What's wrong with it? It could be so much more, you know, with more stuff. It can't be that bad. Let me have a look. No, no, you've got a nice dungeon swamp full of snakes and spikes. Ah, snakes and spikes. Very nice. But, I mean, that's it. How am I supposed to attract adventurers with that? Two words. Dungeon fog. Dungeon what? Dungeon fog. For over three years, we have put all our love and determination into making Dungeon Fog the best battle map map making tool out there. Thanks to you, our amazing community, game masters can pick from over 10,000 community created and shared maps and can turn them into their own epic dungeons to use and share. None of this would have been possible without you. Thank you. And may our tools always help you to create maps your players will never want to leave unexplored. So, what do you think, Goblar? Well, it certainly is different. Different. Hey everybody, welcome to WebDM. I'm Jim Davis and today class is in session. Uh, we're talking about uh, the new book from uh, D&D, Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos. And for me personally, trying to just sort of sort out what kind of book this is, what sort of D&D the book is uh, supporting, um, it was a bit of a, a head scratcher. So uh, <laughs> we'll get into it here in uh, uh, just a second for the capsule review. But after that, uh, I'll dive into a bit more about like how I would use this book, changes I would make, and how I would run certain portions of it. Uh, so if you're interested in more of that kind of thing, uh, then the uh, latter half of the video is, uh, is for you. So, all right, so Strixhaven is the like third, uh, I believe, of the Magic the Gathering settings that has been translated over into D&D. And like, you know, there was Ravnica, there was Theros, both of them are like building on elements that were present in the DMG, like the faction and then the piety system, uh, you know, expanding them in different ways to present the setting. Um, you know, both of those books are presented as like toolkits and, and they have like short little kind of intro adventures, but they're really setting books. And like in particular, Ravnica really impressed me. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen our video on it, uh, yeah, it's a, a few years old, but uh, I think it still stands because I still find that book useful. It's still easy to uh, be inspired by it. And most importantly, I can run away knowing I've got a game prepared that is distinctly Ravnican. Uh, and I can run that for a DD and d group. And so like that was where I was coming from with Strixhaven. It was like, it's new, interesting, kind of like the aesthetic of it, the, 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 the art and the like is not my favorite kind of fantasy. I'm not sure exactly what it's inspired by. It doesn't feel like Harry Potter. Uh, it feels too old for that. Um, but it does have like a lighthearted, whimsical feel to it. Um, similar to Wild Beyond the Witchlight, but very much coming from like a idealized collegiate experience from an American perspective. And even then it's, it's, it's a mishmash of a lot of stuff. So I tried to approach the uh, book with uh, an open mind, accepting that it, you know, 
Might not be my kind of fantasy, might not be my kind of D&D, but it's somebody's kind of D&D. And can I understand it and, and imagine myself enjoying it from that perspective? <clears throat> I don't know that I can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in terms of the breakdown of the book, we have uh, the first two uh, chapters, or rather the introduction in the first chapter, are largely world building and lore. There's a lot of interesting things that they're setting up in these chapters, but there's really no payoff for them. Um, I, I really find it frustrating in the introduction of like, there's these principles of the larger world that Strixhaven is set in, and, and hints of a cosmic conflict, and something big, and like tension within the university itself that's hidden deep, and that the players would unco uncover over time. Like, I thought that's what the adventures were going to be about was this little snippet here and then nothing <laughs> that, that, that was it um there's a bit of mention in the mo uh, monster section about a group of monsters who are like students who didn't get in and now conspire against the university that maybe plays into this but i'm not super familiar with the lore of strixhaven from the uh, card set and so uh i'm, I'm left with a uh, way more questions <laughs> uh that i'd like from it because what's there is interesting Right, it's like this is this magical university where people study like subjects using the application of magic, right? They're not learning magic there, but they're using magic to learn. And that opens up the experience for non-caster classes and, and kind of like fitting this university that seems very cosmopolitan, very like open-minded and honestly, everybody looks happy and well-adjusted and like, where's the adventure part of it? But that's for later. <laughs> like. I could see it being difficult in some settings to fit in, but for the most part, there's a lot of lore here that you could use in your own settings to drive like larger conflicts and the like that I found really interesting and I wish was teased out a bit more. Chapter two, and that's where the player stuff comes in. I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. I had a big summer, we had a Kickstarter, we had a bunch of stuff, and I completely missed that the UA with the multi-class subclass options was scrapped uh, way back in the summer. And like, I opened the chapter and get to it. And I was like, what, where's the, what, what's, what's going on? <laughs> you know, like, so that was a surprise for me, but that's my bad. But what was there in chapter two is like, it's interesting, it's flavorful, it fits the setting, but it's also like thin on the ground. And, and I was hoping for more, right? Like I knew they would do something different with the backgrounds because they've done something different with all of the magic gathering settings backgrounds. So I was expecting something like that. And that you get a feat along with the expanded spell list and the, you know, the, uh, everything else that comes with the background is pretty neat. But then it also kind of like narratively, there's a dissonance. Because it's like, wait a minute, I'm not a student at one of the colleges yet. Why am I picking this background for myself? Shouldn't I get in? Shouldn't I change my other background, my guild artisan background to this uh, when I become second year? So that kind of didn't fit. But, um, you know, the rest of it was interesting. I don't see what the problem is with Silvery Barbs, especially after the errata, uh, where they clarified how it works with legendary resistance. There's still a lot of costs involved to the spell. And unless we're talking like 18th level wizards spamming it all day long, then I don't think it's gonna be as big as a problem as maybe it seems to be. For me, it's one of those, I'm gonna play with it as is, and then if it becomes a problem, I'll fix it. But I'm not looking to change anything right out of the gate with it. Um, there's four other spells. Borrowed Knowledge is pretty fun, but for the most part, there's not a lot of character options. And that sucks. This is a game about playing students in a magic university. And I was hoping for like all sorts of feats that would be like <laughs> really specific to casters and like let those casters adjust and change their magic in ways that are maybe different than meta magic, but are expressive of the type of magic that Strixhaven is supposed to practice. One of the cool things in chapter one that they talk about is the dichotomies between magic, how it's a dialectic between these two opposing forces and that you learn magic by, by learning how to balance that tension and, and, and the push and pull of those opposites is where this magical power comes from. It would've been really cool to have some feats based off of that or something, right? As it stands, it's entirely left to reskinning and flavor. And I... That's fine, I guess, if you want to do that for your games. But I, to me, I'm like, there's something interesting to be explored in how to translate a Magic the Gathering style, color of mana style magic with D&D's pseudo-Vancian, a spell does a thing and nothing else style magic. 
there's ways to try to reconcile those two to, to bring them more into more alignment and that we're three settings in it seems like we're doing that less and less with each release is disappointing it's like I, 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 what does it look like? What do their spell lists look like? What kind of magic do they learn from a Dungeons and Dragons point of view, not just what does it look like when it's uh, reskinned? So I feel like that was a missed opportunity because that's where the setting book kind of ends for me. There's uh, three, four chapters, chapters three, four, uh, five, and six are each adventures. And there's part of chapter three that covers stuff that would happen at life, you know, at the academic life of a student at Strixhaven, you know, regardless of what else was going on, exams and extracurriculars and things like that. The bulk of the book seems to be devoted to these very linear and very uh, like low risk, low stakes adventures that don't seem to have any connective tissue between them. And they don't seem to like provide any guidance of how you put together extracurricular activities, jobs, exams, the events in the, uh, in the adventures that this is supposed to take place over an entire year. Like when and what does a relationship encounter look like? They're referenced, We're, you know, you're told like pick some NPCs that are, uh, you know, maybe one of the party's beloved or rivals or whatever, but the book doesn't tell you when to like, set up those encounters or, or how to set them up so that they have meaning and that there's stakes involved and that they carry the same weight as combat does in Dungeons and Dragons, which is what makes it so fun. And so I really found it like, I expected some adventure. I expected something to help get new DM started and running a campaign in Strixhaven. Like a first semester adventure sounds like a really interesting thing to do. And a highly structured adventure is okay. I play in a game of Pendragon. We're going on something like two years now. It's very different than D&D, but it curiously has a lot of similarities with a Strixhaven campaign in that generally we play the game year by year and we're not exactly allowed to do whatever we want. There are authority figures that our knights have to obey and look up to, like King Arthur and Merlin and our Earl. And it's played over the long term where we're just looking at snippets and moments of these characters' lives across a year and not like spending every day with them. And that requires a bit of structure and advice on how to make it work. Otherwise it starts to feel like a big mess. And really by this point in the review, I'll be honest with you guys, I had a tough time finishing uh, through the uh, adventures. It seems as though it ends with a more classic D&D style adventure of a romp through a forest and the ruins and a fight with a big bad guy. But by that point, I was so underwhelmed by the lack of tension and what seemed like the lack of choice that it was hard to keep going. But I did because, you know, it's the review. <laughs> the monsters in it, I liked. They have that D&D &D, uh, issue of hitting like kittens, um, but they're all really interesting and, and unique, especially the dragons. The dragons were really one of those when reading them of like, they, they felt like a Magic the Gathering monster. Right, when you fight the Prismari dragon, it's gonna do dual types of elemental damage to you. And when it moves, it you know, crackles with lightning. It, it isn't like bound to a certain color and elemental damage scheme like other D&D dragons. And so in that, that sense, it's really cool. Um, there's a lot of interesting monsters from a lore perspective in there, but for the most part, I found them overclocked for their CR, It'd probably boost up the damage uh, for some of their attacks. Or, you can always add in the Archmage stat block to any of the casters that are there. I think there is a game of magical like school embedded within D&D, &D, right? There are wizards and wizards have to learn their spells by books and scrolls and so he teaches them and they've got a bunch of components that they have to get together and arrange in a certain order. They have to learn the gestures, the, the words. They don't have a cosmic patron that just gives it to them. They're not born with it, you know? And so they have got to learn all these. And uh, <laughs> my second game of D&D &D, like ever, uh, was a game where we were all playing magic users in second edition and the DM was like you got to keep track of your spell components You know always <laughs> and that was most of the game was spent trudging around the forests and caves and Local markets looking for the things we needed to even begin to start practicing our spells and like at the time I hated it couldn't stand it largely it had to do with the DM but thinking back on it. It's like there's something really cool about this. There's something really interesting about it. And it ties into what I really like about Strixhaven, which is that D&D is trying something new. 
They are trying to expand the imaginative horizons of the player base of Dungeons and Dragons, reaching out to new players, as well as trying to appeal to older players as well. They've got a big task ahead of them. d and is a big legacy <laughs> uh, IP. There's a huge fan base, diverse fan base, divisive that they're willing to try something new and to go against the grain of what d is popularly conceived of as a monster fighting game where all you do is you know <laughs> you know blood and guts treasure hunters and they're saying like no you can have a light-hearted whimsical experience here it this is low stakes um you know just good times d d and that's all right it's not my d d but I'm glad they're trying something new and I don't want to see them stop. I also like that there is an interesting setting here. The lore that's presented, the setting information that's presented, all of that, it's, it's great, it's interesting. You could incorporate this into Sharn easily. Ar Arcanics as well, uh, uh, Neberon. I don't know about Planescape, uh, his suggestion of Sigil uh, seems off to me given the way the factions work uh, within Sigil and this, but I don't know, you can make almost anything fit. Even if you just take Strixhaven itself and be like, it's a place that connects these five different, like very different places. You can do something with that. Maybe each one of the satellite colleges represents an entirely different material world where the magic that defines say Prismari defines all of the magic that's connected to that world. And when you're on the Prismari College, all you can see is the Prismari College and the central campus, none of the others. And it is this sort of extra dimensional planar crossroads. And then you can do something interesting where you're like, hey, maybe that is why these students are able to get to 10th level by the time they graduate. And then have them actually graduate. It's like, well, the magic of this place lets you practice that level of spell. So you'll be ready for it when you get there on your own out in the quote unquote real world. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do there with the setting, different ways you can take it. And I don't think that the lore of it is so baked in that it wouldn't be too difficult to uh, rescan and put elsewhere. All right, so I'm going to talk about what I didn't like, and um, you know I don't want to be overly negative because you know just don't want to put that out there. <laughs> but I was really disappointed that this book seemed to be more adventure than setting. I was really hoping for something that we get like lots of tables of classroom rumors and like what's going on with the professor this week and and like okay there's a party going down right before midterms and you've got to make the choice to like am I gonna study or am I gonna go uh, bump up my relationship with one of my uh, friends that I'm trying to get to become beloved right like that kind of guidance and structure as like how to create your own as opposed to following this one that they made where there's not really a lot of choice involved. It's really disappointing. And it's doubly so because the adventures are totally dissonant with D&D. <laughs> and I think with Strixhaven. We're told Strixhaven is this like big college where it's like the elite of the elite of the world come here. But it's like the first exam's like a DC 12 to get past it. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like it is it possible at all to get kicked out of the university? Like, there's not even anything detailed about what's around the university if someone wants to, like, just play hooky for the day or do something like that. There's a bog where they keep students in detention, which seems like a really bad idea, uh, honestly. Why they don't just put them on a demi plane? I don't know. But, like, <laughs> there's not a lot of choice, and for it taking up so much space in the book. I was, like I said, it was a uh, it was a disappointment, and I, and I think um, it is is a weak spot uh, on the book. Uh, one of the things about this new turn in Dungeons and Dragons that I've been interested in uh, is like exploring the other pillars of play and how they can be mechanically supported through you know rules and stuff. I think Wild Beyond the Witchlight does a really good job with that. Wild Beyond the Witchlight is a D and D adventure that you can play without needing to resort to violent conflict. But violent conflict is possible. You might not have a choice. Like you're still in a wild fairy realm trying to get something back from a bunch of hags and maybe undo the damage that they did on this unrelated thing. None of that's in Strixhaven, right? There's, there's an awareness that like, hey, we could do something with like extracurricular activities and jobs and exams and, and relationships. But what's presented is, is bare bones and not a lot of guidance of how to put it to use 
how to use it to create moments of tension, of choice, to present players with something that's like, yeah, you are going to have to choose between two mutually desirable but also mutually exclusive options here, right? Just like you would if they were crawling around a sandbox or going in a dungeon or something like that, right? It's just a different context. And that's missing. Instead, it's mostly just like, yeah, you get an extra D4 that's going to go on top of the bardic inspiration and the spells you get and the advantage from that thing. And it's going to be, you know, like it's D&D. &D, how many times, you know, if you really want to pass an ability check, you can pass an ability check. And a lot of the relationship stuff comes down to just like, well, you do this extracurricular activity, so you get a point to adjust with the relationship up and down. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a whole section in the DMG about interacting with NPCs and changing their attitudes and, you know, how they respond to requests. We can't integrate that into this. Like, we can't use the relationship points as a tracker for how deep and meaningful or, or rather how uh, rancorous and, and uh, filled with animosity a relationship is. That's all we need, right? Just a simple progress tracker and guidance on when it changes. And... Like I said, it's a good start, but it's also uh, very lackluster. And I, that extends to the game of Mage Tower and the exams. And uh, There's nothing wrong with just rolling an ability check, which most of them are. But there's no choice involved other than which proficiencies did you pick at character creation? And did you choose to play in this adventure or not? And that is not fun. That is where I would get off this adventure. Even, you know, because it's like... I. I don't like I want to make some kind of choice or decision that's going to affect the outcome of it. It doesn't seem like that that's what it counted for. Tying into a lot of this is that the book presents a lot of nuggets stuff. It says this is what it could be like. This is what it, you know, this is the adventure this this year it consists of these five scenes or whatever. And there's not really like guidance on how to put that together into something that is meaningful. That, that presents players with a sense of continuity, that presents players with a sense that, that they have a choice in the matter, that, that, that they're living the lives of these characters vicariously over the course of these semesters. And that, like, more than, more than the other stuff that I, that I was, didn't like about it, like, that really hurts because that means that they're gonna put a book out there that is trying to do something new and then doesn't guide new DMs or DMs who are only used to one style of play through it of how to put this together into something. And that's like, to me, a real missed opportunity about the book because it could have been great. It could have been something that's like, listen, this is different than any D&D &D you've ever seen. We're playing over the course of years. We're not worried about how many combats per day we're getting in. This is about how you relate to imaginary people, <laughs> you know, how well you learn to understand them, navigate the rivalries of a, of a high stakes, high consequences magic school where, where your life is on the line. That's D&D. That's not the book we got. <clears throat> Here's how I change things when I run this book. Number one, the mechanical stuff. I would move away as much as possible from just simple ability checks. An example would be Mage Tower, right? As presented in the book, this like centerpiece what I've seen called a skill challenge uh, it is consists of like a player rolling six different abilities um, you know the proficiencies they don't get to choose uh, it's, it's the same ones for everyone if you have a spell it may grant you advantage it may be automatic um, and then it's over and it's like wait a minute this is a game this is a sport our characters are playing where's the choice where's the <laughs> where's the decision making in here um, I toyed around and thought about it. It really would depend uh, how I run it, but I think you could do it just like D&D combat and with the rule that if anyone takes any hit point damage, that's a penalty. They're out, right? You look at the level one through three spells, there are plenty in there that have some kind of ability to control, to, you know, obfuscate, to something, you know, like to mess with an enemy enough to get one of these mascots and get it away. And, and by treating it as a combat encounter, you also get to deal with the fact that like one of the mascots can make itself huge, right? <laughs> the, uh, another one is an ooze that can slip through your fingers. Like that seems like an interesting challenge to present to a party that says, 
capture this beast, bring it to your side as many times as you can while keeping the other team from doing that. And we already have a structure for how we adjudicate actions in a fast paced, high stakes environment it's called combat. Why not just lean into that? But even, let's say you don't want to do that, right? Let's say it's too much work, take too long. How I would run it then is a group of uh, opposed skill checks in which everyone on the team um, ha makes a uh, skill check, probably of their choice, but I might have some examples set out and then they just can't make the same one like twice in a row. Each match consists of two rounds of this. You tally up the totals. It gives you a lot more variable outcomes. There's a sense of like, oh my God, the in the first quarter, this happened. How are we going to deal with that? Blah, 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 blah. And then you sort of like work your way through it, having the players narrate what they're going to do, having, you know, you know, what the NPCs are going to do, making sure that they know that like, oh yeah, the guy that you're opposing is, is you know, looking, looking to block you with some kind of like wall or something like that, right? You work through it as you go, but it's more just sort of opposed group checks. So like I said, that's sort of back of the envelope, uh, first pass, uh, how I would handle that one. As for the relationships, I would just merge what's there with the uh, rules in the DMG and probably make it so that different people have different levels of relationship points you need to earn with them in order to become beloved. And that if you know their ideals or you appeal to their bonds, you get to know them, right? You show them that you care about them and that you're worth investing in, then you know that might lower the uh, threshold for that. <clears throat> and that really comes to like, one of the things that I would do with this campaign is like, I'm looking at every opportunity to inject it with tension and stakes. Right, like thinking about relationship encounters. All over the book, there are these spots where it says, you could have a relationship encounter here. And like, I, I get it. <laughs> I've been running games for a long time. I learned how to incorporate a lot of this stuff into my campaigns just sort of organically because I wanted it. And I felt like, hey, if I put a big social scene in, maybe one of my players will get a kick out of it. You know, maybe, maybe one time, one of them is not gonna just gut an NPC before I even had a chance to name them. Not that it ever got that bad, but like that was something that I deliberately did over a long time. And, and like when you're setting up a relationship encounter, when you're setting up a social interaction, like there's a tendency to think of it as something different than just an encounter. And I don't think that there is. You still need context. What's going on around them? Where's the location? What's the, the, the social and relational context of for this particular encounter? between these two particular characters, NPC, NPC alike. You know, what are, what are the goals of both of the participants in it? And what are, the, you know, what are their motivations? What, what are they trying to get out of it? And where is that coming from? Because that's gonna color what that encounter looks like. And it's gonna let me both like role play that NPC to the best of my ability in the term of like portraying them and, and having them be a, a real thing, a real uh, a person for even just a moment. And then the PC does their thing. Maybe there's some charisma checks involved or something, but I, I want to frame those and set those scenes up so that there is something at stake. We never leave a relationship scene without something having changed about that, whether the relationship deepened, whether it spread further apart, whether there's an unresolved tension that the next scene or further down, we will have to resolve. And for now it sort of hangs in the balance, the potential for like, inter-party rivalry based on like, hey, uh, you know, player sitting next to me, your character's beloved is my rival. Like, what's the deal? This person's a real piece, you know? Like, all of that is opens up. And if you allow yourself to play in that mode and to accept that like, social stakes are real stakes. It doesn't have to be that my character dies or loses magic items or whatever, you know. It could be that like I lose a friendship. I lose an opportunity to get to know someone better. I didn't get to show my rival up. Those are stakes and those kinds of things. And that's what I'm looking to introduce. And you can, you can be damn well sure that as many times as I can, there is a party the night before midterms and finals, right? <laughs> like you're gonna have to make a choice over whether or not you study or you earn points with your beloved. You're gonna have to make a choice over which class you're studying for, who you're studying with, whether you're gonna be able to pass those tests and all of those DCs are going up, right? Like this is top tier university. We're talking DC 20 minimum. What I want to get out of all of this are chances for the players to make choices, to say like, yeah, man, this semester's got me killer. Like I did not take proficiency in nature. I do not, <laughs> I, you know, I just don't have that good of a run number. I need everything I can get, but this other thing is going on. This other thing I want is happening. And that's the kind of thing I want to set up. And you could set that up 
as a kind of social point crawl. The maps in Strixhaven are great, easy to turn into a sort of nested point crawl. Now all of a sudden it's like, I gotta get from one part of campus to another within a certain time. Those moments that you're zooming in, that you're saying we're not talking about weeks at a time, but we're looking at today, right now, then it matters where you are on campus, how you get there. Those kinds of choices are how you're gonna interject the kind of tension and stakes in the social encounters that I think the game needs. All right, I'm back. We had a break, we had to let the cat out. The cat wasn't there, we might have to do it again. So, <clears throat> another thing that I would do when it comes to running a game uh, from Strixhaven is I'm gonna impose a structure on things, right? I play a game of Pendragon, and Pendragon has this structure of like, you know, there, every, every uh, adventure lasts a year. And so in the springtime, you go to the feast and you learn your rumors. What is it you know, you're gonna be doing, that kind of thing. In the summer, you go to battle or have an adventure or whatever. Fall, you do your own thing. It's for personal stuff. Maybe you get raided, you know, that, you know it's for the, uh, you know, the more player directed uh, type of adventures. Whereas the summer is more, your Lord told you to be here, so you better be there. And then the winter is about housekeeping, domestic stuff. And then you're into the next year. And, the years roll by and soon you realize that like your character's like 20 years older than they were than they first, than when you first made them. And it's because it has a structure to play that embraces the long term. And I think that's what this needs for Strixhaven. For me, I would go with a semester by semester structure and say like, listen, we're gonna take the semester as a whole. When it's over, there will be a break, right? We'll have some downtime and the like. And in that semester, there's gonna be a rhythm to it. There's the first day. I'm gonna steal the uh, stuff from chapter five, the, masquer uh, the Magister's Masquerade. It's a great party setup, and it's a good thing to build on, and I think every semester could begin with a mixer, right? You're returning back, time to meet who, you know, <laughs> who's new on campus, reunite with some old friends. I think it works as a way to kick off a semester of a uh, school year. And then we spend some time dealing with the downtime activities, the big stuff, so that we know what the tenor of daily life over the long term is between the beginning of the semester and midterms. We're dealing with extracurriculars, which become a downtime activity, which means that there's a chance that complications arise from them. And during these scenes, there are opportunities if a player wants to go into detail and to play moment by moment so that they have a chance to earn via their decisions and die rolls a relationship point with one of the NPCs that's associated with that and turn it into something that the player is more active in rather than just, well, I pick this thing, now I get this automatically. That gives a certain sort of rhythm to it because after you've taken care of that, you can ask the player, well, what do you do in your free time during this? Because midterms are coming up. And then we present something uh, of a choice. Do you study? Do you do this other thing? Is there something going on at school? All of this would be fueled by expanding on the random tables that are already in the book, which are great, by the way. <laughs> They're really flavorful, really cool, lots of interesting stuff going on in them. So take those, strip them out, expand them, and then tie them to various locations and events that are gonna happen throughout the year. And then the second half of the semester, which I call uh, the later semester, because you know, it's like early in the semester, you've got time to read your syllabus, guys, right? Like early in the semester is when you get your spell component pouches stocked up. It's when you get your second spell focus. Late, this late in the semester, we can't do that. There's no way we could change your grade now. That kind of shit, right? Second half of the semester is similar to that, except this is where the big adventure happens, right? This is where the mage tower game is. This is where they got to go in the bog and fight the thing, right? This is where like the big set piece from the book adventure is, but it's been telegraphed in the first part of the semester. And then you just keep doing that until you've done like, you know, eight or so semesters and you'll probably be tired of playing the game by then. And I think that'd be fine. I think it would slow the game down a bit, give a chance for those relationships to develop. We're talking about something that might be 10 to 14 scenes per semester per player, right? This could be a long game. That's at most. Like I'm getting a, a weird look from, uh, from Emma. It's not, that's at most, not the, the one at minimum. <laughs> uh, and I think that if you slowed down and embraced a kind of more laid back long-term view, you could really get a lot out of it. Uh, and the last thing I do, of course, like I mentioned, is create a more robust toolkit uh, for running games set here. I'm going to make a carousing table. I'm going to make complication tables for studying, for exams, for all kinds of things, for parties that are there. 
rumors by semester, you know, and even good old fashioned adventure stuff, right? Like there's monsters loose in this part of the university, etc. Excuse me, kitty. She's back. We didn't let her out. <laughs> Come here, <clears throat> yep. I'm doing all kinds of tables. Uh, is what I'm doing. And also take the safety net away. There's no NPCs coming to save you. You're, this is the university where you learn to become hot shit, right? <laughs> this is the university that when you graduate, you graduate close to tier three, you know? <laughs> so. The idea is that, yeah, there's probably a very high uh, dropout mortality and fail rate uh, for members of Strixhaven. And like that, again, introduces stakes, consequences. You know, one of the inspirations I was thinking of for this when I was reading Strixhaven was um, Name of the Wind, right? And Kvothe, the main character, trying to get into university where he's going to learn magic and like just how he's going to pay for it, who's going to sponsor him, the fact that he has to like trick his way in and it pisses off a bunch of people. So he's like day one already has enemies. Like that's the kind of game I want to run. Not a game of what looks like very well-adjusted college students on an idealized campus having hijinks. Like if that's your kind of fantasy, no shade, that's fine. You enjoy that. And I hope you have a great time with this book. But like I said at the beginning, I tried to approach it from a perspective of like, this isn't made for me, which is okay right for one but what can i enjoy out of it as it is and i was disappointed at every turn and that's a shame like i love dnd and not just because it's dnd right i dnd was not my first game I, I came into it late in my role-playing life but i love it and i love that it can be more than just a monster fighting game and so it's sad to see that something that was presented as part of this turn of dnd of like showing us what's what it could be falls flat so i hope this was helpful for you if any of it sounded interesting pick up the book see what you like there's definitely gems there and interesting stuff that you can use for your game it's a shame that it doesn't work as is but you could make it into something and with the right group and the right dm and the willingness to work and put effort into it i bet you'd have an amazing game something really fun if you want us to hear a bit more longer rambly talk and a bit more in-depth review about each of the individual chapters, you can go and check us out over at WebDM Talks on all podcasting apps. And if you like the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and help us appease the algorithm gods so that we can continue to feed this sweet kitty right here. Yeah. Isn't she great? Yeah. And if you haven't yet, you can pre-order our book over at Backer Kit. We're hard at work finishing up the last few chapters. Trust me, it's a lot of hard work, but it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be great. I think you guys will love it. So go and check it out. You can find the link in the description. See y'all next week. Magical attacks. Waiting for our own random encounter to pass. <laughs>